a pleasure to welcome to the program journalist from Fire Dog Lake, Kevin Gastola. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the time, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, tomorrow night, uh, we will be in New York City. I know you're actually at an airport uh, now, I think, uh, en route. But uh, tomorrow night, we'll be uh, uh, doing a panel. I've already, uh, I've already mentioned it on the program on, uh, on, on Bradley Manning. And uh, I should also say that you're going to be in New York tonight, um, I believe, um, interviewing uh, Phil Donahue on uh, his documentary. Is that right? That's correct, and, and and also, you know, it's 10 years since the Iraq War. I'm going to talk to him about Mia culpas in the media, and, and just you know, get his opinion on where things are at. Yeah, those, uh, well, there's plenty to talk about, uh, those Mia culpas. Uh, we'll put a link uh, on uh, majority.fm uh, to that tonight. Uh, where is the location? Do you know? I'm sorry, I don't have that information, but... Oh, yeah, we're doing it at the Culture Project. It's on uh, 45 Bleecker Street in New York. Uh, I believe that's in the Manhattan area. Yep, that's right. It's uh, it's downtown, uh, just north of Houston. Okay, so let let's get in. Will you, uh, for the sake of catching, making sure that everybody's on the same page, just give us a broad recap of the uh, Bradley Manning case and where where we are now in the uh, government's prosecution of of Bradley Manning. Well, currently. We have a, a trial scheduled for June 3rd, and Manning himself gave a statement in court on February 28th, and he pled guilty to some of the offenses in the charges that the government has uh, been pushing against him. And he himself has accepted responsibility for passing information on to WikiLeaks. And now, uh, what stands uh, the situation is uh, the government could accept the plea, they could decide to not pursue other charges, or they could go forward. And they so far have indicated they have every intention of pursuing the more severe charges. So uh, to break down the charges, Manning pled guilty to uh, the willful communication of the information. He pled guilty to possessing that information and that he was unauthorized to possess it in the way that he did. And he... And now, just to remind folks, the information that you're referring to uh, consists of the collateral damage, the so-called collateral damage uh, video of, um, uh, of U.S. forces uh, killing two uh, Reuters um, uh, reporters and a... Um, uh, a third person who is attempting to um, provide uh, medical attention, I guess, to um, uh, supposed uh, militants. In addition, um, thousands of of cables, is, uh, uh, diplomatic cables. Yeah, that's correct, and we have uh, we have Iraq war logs, we have Afghan war logs. Uh, you know, those those Iraq war logs are actually have been making headlines because the Guardian's been doing reporting with them in the past month, uh, finding details on how General David Petraeus was likely connected to uh, Iraqi death squads in the the country. Uh, so Manning himself has admitted that that information was provided to WikiLeaks and. Now the, the government has the ability to push more severe charges that Manning claims or, or his defense believes Manning did not commit, uh, such as uh, aiding the enemy, the most severe charge, the one that I think is probably the most egregious and shows that the government is trying to make an example out of him. And, uh, but I won't go into much detail on that yet. Uh, maybe we'll go into it some more after I lay out the other charges. He's uh, facing uh, charges under the Espionage Act, and Obama himself has brought a record amount of cases against uh, alleged leakers or whistleblowers under the Espionage Act. Um, he also faces a violation of a federal larceny statute, so they want to argue that he stole or purloined or converted the information improperly, and, uh, and that's how they're pursuing him. So he does not think he committed any of these federal offenses, but he has admitted that he violated military codes and, and that was quite obvious. It was pretty clear that he was going to have to admit or confess that he violated those military codes. 
And so let's talk about, um, uh, in particular, aiding the uh, enemy. Uh, this is a this is a charge, uh, though. While the government has indicated it will not seek the death penalty, it is a charge. Uh, it is a capital offense. That's correct, and it's also is an any person offense. So everyone should be concerned. Don't just say I'm not in the military. I don't have to worry about it. The aiding the enemy charge could be attached to. Uh, somebody who gets designated an enemy combatant. Um, in fact, I think the military has used some form of this charge against people in the war on terrorism who uh, they have wanted to bring into a, a court to to prosecute them for war crimes. I, I believe so. Uh, the way now, I, I want to I want to put a fine point on this because uh, people need to really understand the difference here. That charge of aiding the enemy, uh, it, had Bradley Manning simply been um, a civilian and had uh, come across this material in some fashion and had passed it on, uh, like he said in his statement, he attempted to pass it on uh, to the New York Times and um, I believe it was the Washington Post, and uh, had a civilian done this, and then ultimately to WikiLeaks, had a civilian done this, they would still be subject to that same charge, just to be clear on that. Yeah, to be clear, you could still bring an aiding the enemy charge against a, a person. Uh, but I, I tend to think that they're using the aiding the enemy charge because they can, because Manning is a soldier. Uh, and the other thing to add in our conversation here is that uh, there's a there's a well-known exchange now that happened during the pretrial proceedings where the judge actually asked the uh, prosecutor point blank if it was uh, that he had provided information to the New York Times or the Washington Post. Would you be prosecuting him in the way that you have? To get to the idea or the issue of what is WikiLeaks, because really in this trial we have, or these proceedings, we haven't defined or come to an agreement on what WikiLeaks happens to be. You know, the defense says it's a media organization. The other one, I think, would dispute that it is and, and would put it in the realm of some kind of a, a hacktivist uh, cult or a group that is engaging in acts that are detrimental to the security of the United States. Uh, so, so she asked her this question, and, and she replied, yes. So their claim is that it wouldn't matter. Um, and then that is very profound. I think people should be concerned, because that in itself indicates a risk to press freedom. I mean, you can extend it out and say, um, you know, I don't know how much you're aware of the way that they're going about proving this charge, but allegedly they have digital media obtained in a raid on Osama bin Laden's compound, and it shows that he asked a uh, person, a member of al-Qaeda, for this uh, information and said that he wanted to uh, have this to, to use for his own purposes and, and asked for the state copies of State Department cables and asked for even some copies of Iraq or, or Afghanistan war logs and wanted to to read them. And this is part of the evidence that they're using to push the case. And not even more. It gets even more insidious because there is apparently a person who is a member of this SEAL team that went on the mission who is a, a, who they call a, a DOD operator who is not being allowed uh, to be interviewed by the defense. The defense wants to talk to him, but they're being obstructed on, on the basis that uh, – it, it, it just makes no sense. And uh, they are having these issues around getting to him. And this is a key witness that they're going to use to make these claims about this evidence. Okay, so let's just, uh, I just want to, I just want to lay this out because uh, Yoki Benkler, a, um, uh, a law professor at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Berkman Center uh, for Internet and Society at Harvard, um, uh, points to this um, uh, this notion that uh, somehow uh, Manning was aiding uh, the enemy because this information showed up on on uh, Bin Laden's or, or allegedly showed up on Bin Laden's computer um, would be the equivalent of of Daniel Ellsberg being uh, charged with the same thing. It had uh, the Viet Cong uh, read the New York Times, essentially, um, uh, and read the Pentagon Papers uh, in the New York Times. And the, the reason why the defense would want to, um, would want to interview the uh, member of that SEAL team would probably to ask, would be to ask them, 
what else was on that computer? In other words, if uh, there's probably a wide range of, of things that uh, bin Laden was reading about the United States, and this would have been simply a part of it that would have theoretically also been uh, published in, uh, in, 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 in international publications. Right. Well, I mean, to make another point, this, this is incredibly ridiculous on the, on the fact that if you were to go through all these statements that uh, al-Qaeda or its affiliates have ever made where it used uh, a journalist's work, perhaps maybe Bob Woodward, or um, a writer's work, maybe we're talking like Noam Chomsky or, or someone else, and, uh, and if you were to maybe even look at a president or, or past uh, officials in government whose statements have been taken out of context or, or interpreted and used um, when arguing or, or trying to justify or, or issue uh, you know, edicts or whatever you want to call them to members of the group to say, you have to take this action. It goes, to, I, I would happen to think that there would be a long list of people that you right. would have to start putting under investigation and would have to pursue for, quote unquote, aiding the enemy. Uh, so that's how like ridiculous it is the government is going after Bradley Manning in this fashion. Okay, and and so uh, this is where we are at this juncture. We are waiting to hear if the government will continue to pursue these uh, capital offense charges or simply accept uh, what more or less constitutes a, um, uh, a a plea, I guess, by Bradley Manning. Let me um, uh, let me ask you one of the, the the central questions about this case that I think. Um, in, in your mind, is Bradley Manning a whistleblower, and, and, and what, is the, what does it mean if he is? Well, I, I said this much uh, in a Nation article that I wrote um, a couple weeks ago that I believe that Manning is a classic whistleblower and that he uh, himself, uh, you, you can read through his statement and see that w what he was doing indicates uh, that he you know, he wanted to expose what he believed to be misconduct or wrongdoing, and and so that people could see it. I'm we're we're sitting here right now having this conversation, and tomorrow is the anniversary of the release of the collateral murder video. So because there are multiple examples, I'll take this one example because I think it's a very very rich example of how Manning is a whistleblower. So what he said in his statement was that he was able to find this video because he was in uh, the intelligence facility where he was working as an analyst, and other soldiers were viewing it. Um, they had a discussion about how it violated the rules of engagement, and and what he did is some research to figure out what this uh, video was and figured out that Reuters had been trying to obtain it because the, the video actually shows that uh, uh, a Reuters journalist is being killed, as you said, at the front of this segment. And uh, Reuters had been trying to get this through a Freedom of Information Act request and CENTCOM, U.S. Central Command, had been blocking it and, and was not responsive to it. So he wanted to get this video to um, Reuters um, and also, uh, you know, he wanted to release the video so that everybody could view it so people could see what was happening. Uh, he characterized it as war porn in his statement. Um, and, and said that he was just really bothered in, by how uh, the soldiers were talking in the video, and he described what they were doing as maybe holding a magnifying glass up to a bunch of ants and um, trying to melt them uh, because uh, what they were doing was, you know, they were hovering over them in this gunship and were firing on people who were helpless and wounded. And, and he didn't just want to release the video. He wanted to go through uh, an effort to actually send the a copy on a CD to uh, Reuters in London so that they would have an actual authentic copy. So if the U.S. military said, this isn't really the video, they would be able to go, no, we've got it, and it's got all the authentic data on it that can prove. And, and this shows that you, you know, you, you were, your soldiers were responsible for killing our employees. Um, so that just, you know, that adds to my feeling that uh, he is a whistleblower. And, 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 and what of those people who say, well, had he just released the collateral damage video as opposed to uh, the 
um, thousands of cables and logs, uh, maybe your case would be solid. But um, what is what is your what what is your response to that um, that claim? Well, I don't know if the rebuttal I would give to that is sufficient enough to end debate. But um, in my conversations with uh, Justice Department whistleblower, now works for the Government Accountability Project, Jocelyn Raddick, uh, she has told me that the Justice Department won't accept uh, the amount of information as part of the defense. In other words. Uh, they'll pursue leakers for not releasing enough information. They'll pursue them for releasing too much information. So they could say, um, you're only showing a sliver of what's going on. There are many more documents, and it would say that we actually are doing what we're supposed to do. There's no misconduct. And had this whistleblower release that material, it would show we were doing things appropriately. Um, so if you reduce too much, then they say there's too much information. Okay, so in other words, uh, under the uh, Whistleblower Protection Act, and it does not necessarily apply here, although there is a military Whistleblower Protection Act, it defines whistleblowing as, um, as, 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 as releasing information that you believe is indicative of criminal or corruption act, uh, corruptive activities. And so what you're saying here is that if I was to le uh, release 10 documents and only three of them uh, indicated in uh, that uh, corruption, it would not necessarily mean that I hadn't been a whistleblower uh, and vice versa. If I show only one of those three documents, uh, it would not n necessarily mean I was not a whistleblower. Yeah, well, so look, there's an issue here because, and, and I think this is where people get into a contentious debate. Uh, and so whistleblower is actually a legal term. So uh, there are some who I've gotten into a discussion with that are bothered by attaching this label because under law, Manning could not be considered a whistleblower. Now, I, my, my response to that is I think that the public, you know, citizens in this country, should make that decision themselves. I mean, after all, their government is making this decision to go after this person. And I think that uh, you can have uh, a sort of sense of the public that, it, it, in terms of public opinion, is Manning a whistleblower. And uh, I think that's something that people in this country have, a, have an ongoing debate with. It certainly does not have to be settled today. It doesn't have to be settled after he's convicted and put into jail. I'm sure people will be debating this question for many years. But I think that after the statement, it shows that because he was doing research about the documents, because he selected sets, and and he did not release the, all the information he had access to, there was much more information that he could have released if he if he just wanted to um, share everything that he had access to with WikiLeaks. He certainly could have done that, but he did not. He had rational explanation for each set of documents that was provided, or, or for the video that was provided. And I myself find that to indicate that he is a whistleblower. Um, and then there's another context. I don't know if we have time to fully get into it, but, but the other context is that I just can't get past the fact that there are so many officials from uh, the previous administration under George W. Bush who committed war crimes who have not been prosecuted, um, who have not been investigated fully, and are, are enjoying impunity. And I, I look at what Bradley Manning is doing. I look at what other, other soldiers have have done and have, um, and that there are cases that could have been brought against them for uh, committing crimes, and those cases weren't brought. And I say to myself, is it is it right that that people um, would want more punishment for Manning? I mean, he went in he was in prison for nine months at Quantico, and the judge found that he was unlawfully punished, and then during that time he was held in conditions of solitary confinement. So I think there's a there's a larger context mm. to this. Um, if you don't think it's a whistleblower, then there's this other context of, is it right that we are going after him? I mean, right. I mean, if we're going to move forward and not look back, could we do it for Bradley Manning? Right. And, uh, and, 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 and we should say at this point, is there any, has there been any, um, has there been any showing by the government at any time in any forum that the release of those documents, um, and, uh, and the, the video has, uh, materially uh, impacted anyone's safety or, or harmed U.S. security? 
there's been no evidence presented. Um, I was at a panel event where P.J. Crawley, the former State Department spokesperson, spoke, and he said that hundreds of individuals had been harmed in involved in the you know the State Department. Uh, I, I, I know that there was embarrassment, and they had to shuffle around people who were ambassadors uh, and maybe even uh, remove some people from their jobs uh, because what was revealed in the cable showed that there were backroom dealings going on, that there were things that were the way that the United States is handling diplomacy was was not something that other countries would approve of if they knew the full extent. Uh, but they have not shown that any informants uh, who were informing about the Taliban were uh, killed. They haven't shown anyone who had information revealed about them was subjected uh, you know, to inhumane treatment or anything and killed. Uh, I know that there was an Ethiopian journalist that had to flee. That, that was a story. But believe me, if there were people who had right. died, we would hear about them. Right. Um, our government would make sure that we knew that Bradley Manning had been responsible for the death of someone, and I have not heard about it yet. Um, now let's talk uh, just uh, briefly uh, about the the tremendous amount of, 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 of lack of coverage that is, that is sort of, and the sort of minimal amount of coverage of the lack of coverage. Um, I, I think um, uh, short of yourself uh, and Alexa O'Brien, who's going to join us on, um, on this panel, and um, a third reporter um, uh, whose name escapes me, forgive me. Um, His name is Adam Klasfeld. Yes, and uh, short of the three of you, um, there has not been any reporters who have been covering this on a consistent day-to-day -day basis. Uh, yeah, that that is correct. That uh, there there are only about three people who have consistently been there um, at every proceeding. Uh, I guess I would give credit and add uh, Clark Stokely, who is our uh, our courtroom sketch artist, who has been doing uh, good sketches that I have included in my posts, but he certainly hasn't been necessarily, you know, reporting and giving people the the, the best insights. That's not his job. Uh, but he has been there, too, so I would give him credit. But these bigger organizations like, uh, you know, the Washington Post and, and then more significantly the New York Times, which uh, benefited from publishing the information that WikiLeaks had from Manning, they, you, the New York Times showed up for the first time in almost a year uh, in December of 2012. They weren't there at the beginning of the, the major hearing on Manning's treatment at Quantico, uh, which was a huge hearing. Um, it went on for over two weeks, and there were between 10 and 20 witnesses that took stand, and they were all from the chain of command, and it was incredible. I mean, the, 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 this hearing was a story in and of itself. Um, and... Uh, they weren't there. Uh, they showed up at the end because the public editor, Margaret Sullivan, who I really have deep admiration for, wrote two columns about why isn't the New York Times there covering? Um, and, and that was very important. And I think it shamed them and got them to send two of their reporters. And so now they've been there covering. Uh, but it, it, I really do have to point out that I travel from Chicago. Alexa travels from New York City. Adam travels from New York City as well. There, people who have been covering this aren't people who actually live in Washington, D.C. Right. Where are the journalists who actually live in Washington, D.C.? And I would go outside of just the establishment journalists. Where are the independent and alternative journalists who could also be going there? Because I have to say that it's relatively easy to get credentialed. I mean, they've credentialed the Bradley Manning Support Network reporter to cover, and they didn't want to, but they have because... It, they're just they're not filled to capacity, so they might as well give everyone a credential that wants to be there in the media center. Just to contextualize this, I mean, I don't know who the last uh, individual in this country was charged with aiding and abetting uh, the enemy, where, where an, uh, an American uh, uh, military or national security uh, personnel was charged with this, but I mean, you know, if, if this uh, person is uh, presumably to be tried for a capital okay, offense, the idea that the, the, the major media uh, would not be covering this is sort of, is, is stunning. I mean, what, what do you think accounts for this? 
Well, I would also add that there was an amazing coverage of the releases, at, and particularly for the cables. Uh, you could see almost wall-to-wall coverage from November 30th, 2010, through the first couple of weeks of December. Well, I mean, uh, you, 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 you mentioned yourself that it's still being used by the Guardian uh, newspaper, and I think there is literally, uh, on any given week, at least um, a number of accounts that reference those cables and no longer even uh, reference them as the cables, as much as sort of simply now it is uh, in the... Um, in the ether, I guess, in terms of our knowledge of certain instances. Yeah, that's correct. So, and I, I must mention that, like, yeah, Ed Pilkington of The Guardian has been there. But, you know, the, the problem I have is that uh, there's, there's, this, there's this thing that, like, a lot of journalists in establishment and, and more prominent news organizations are doing is, is when they, they're only coming when they think there's going to be a headline that they're going to be able to report. And that's not the way to do it because there is a you know this whole process is cumulative, and if you miss a couple of days, then you're going to show up and you're not really going to know what is being litigated. I mean, it is that um, is that uh, I mean it's, it's that complicated. So why is it this way? I mean, uh, so the New York Times is excuse was that this is a pre-trial process and we wouldn't uh, go, uh, you wouldn't typically cover that. I don't think that's particularly true. And I spoke to Arun Rath with, uh, who, who, who did a little post about the media coverage, and, and he, and he uh, is working with PBS Frontline. And, and, uh, and, he, and he and I, we both agreed that this doesn't seem to be a valid excuse because uh, the, the pretrial proceedings for the 9-11 terror suspects at Guantanamo, they're, uh, they're getting lots of coverage. Right. The uh, Nishiri, who's uh, alleged to have bombed the USS Cole, his pretrial proceeding is getting a lot of coverage um, for, for that. So why not Bradley Manning's case? Uh, so I just, um, there is no valid explanation. I, I think that we could try to find one, but we're not going to find one. Right. Um, and now let me just ask you, uh, just, uh, I, I want to just touch on, you have uh, joined in into a, uh, a lawsuit. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, tell us about that. You've, um, you have, uh, you have, you and I think, uh, Alexa O'Brien, um, and, and others, um, are plaintiffs in a lawsuit. Uh, tell us what that, uh, that, that, that lawsuit is. All right. So uh, currently, uh, when you, sh- when you show up to report on the Bradley Manning proceedings, you're not given any copies of court records, but we're talking about judges' orders, we're talking about decisions in the proceedings and motions from the defense or the government. Those are not handed to you by any of the people who are taking care of the media. And the reason is because the, the, the military uh, wants, has, has decided that they'll keep these secret. In fact, in all court-martial cases, you are not given access to records from the proceedings. And, and we find this to be... Um, uh, just the way that they're doing this makes it hard to cover the proceedings, and it, it basically goes to undermining press freedom when you get down to it. And so I've signed on to uh, this lawsuit that's being brought by the Center for Constitutional Rights. Other plaintiffs that are on are include uh, the names that are there, Glenn Greenwald, uh, Jeremy Scahill with The Nation, Amy Goodman of Democracy Now!, even WikiLeaks and Julian Assange are are named to it. Uh, Chase Madar wrote a book, Passion of Bradley Manning, all of these individuals. Um, Alexa and I, who have actually been there reporting, have written declarations and described uh, what it is like to actually uh, go and uh, report there and how that you can't, uh, basically, how when you're sitting there, you have to struggle to keep up with the judge because when she reads the ruling, um, she reads about 180 words per minute which is almost impossible to keep up, especially when those rulings take uh, an hour to an hour and a half to read, as has been the case with the very important rulings about uh, his treatment at Quantico or whether his speedy trial rights had been violated. Uh, you, you should have been there to hear the speedy trial ruling. It was an alphabet agency soup and a, a, a long list, a laundry list of dates that you could not uh, keep up with 
to accurately report to the public what was being read. All right. And, uh, um, now, Kevin, uh, we just got a, a, a couple minutes here, um, and uh, I know you got to get on a plane. Uh, but just give me a sense. Uh, tomorrow, again, to remind people, um, um, I will be moderating a panel, which you'll be a part of, as well as with uh, Brigitte John's daughter, the uh, Icelandic MP and weekly activist, Alexa O'Brien, and Peter Hart. Um, what, what do you think is one of the more important things that, that should come out at that panel tomorrow? I think people should just understand that Manning's case is part of, uh, I think it represents the, the fact that there has been uh, a certain level of lawlessness and impunity that now exists in this country. And one of the things that most bothers me about the pursuit of Bradley Manning and, and the way people, there, there are some in this country who want to see justice for him. I just, I, it really bothers me that people want justice for him, but then they don't want justice for other people who I think have committed far worse crimes. And, um, and I just put it that way because I think that you have to allow this sort of thing to happen, or you have to accept that it will happen. That people inside these agencies, these employees, are going to release information if if they can see that. Um, those agencies or, or within the military, there are cover-ups going on or, or that certain individuals are not going to be held accountable or, you know, maybe in the case of, of, of this recent person who's taking a higher position in the CIA, it seems, you know, if you destroy torture tapes, you get a promotion. Uh, so it's like, I think that's the big thing that people need to focus on, this larger context. Of, I mean, you can talk just about Manning, but, but we really do have this bigger thing going on here in this country of, of, of not being able to take care of individuals who have committed crimes in government and actually hold them accountable. Kevin Gastola from Fire Dog Lake, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night.